All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good evening, everyone. Thanks for attending. I'm, my name's John Francis. I'll be your presenter tonight. I'm a consultant with Home Sackett, and I also have uh, the responsibility of being the More Beef from Pastures MLA-funded uh, New South Wales State Coordinator. Tonight, I'm going to run through the procedure for tonight's webinar. I'm going to introduce you to the webinar platform and how to interact within the webinar. I'm going to introduce you to the MLA More Beef from Pastures program. Then I'll deliver the presentation and finally we'll go through questions. There's a survey at the end which is particularly important to us to make sure that we're generating a reasonable return on your investment of uh, levies to MLA. So if you can turn your attention to that, it will automatically pop up at the end of the webinar. What I might do is just direct you to a pop-up tab somewhere within your screen. The way we've worked this is that you don't have the capacity to use the microphone, but the way that you can interact with me is to ask questions, and I notice someone's already let me know that they can hear loud and clear, which is great. Thanks very much, Ross. If anyone else can just uh, go through that process of typing in that in that question box that you can hear me loud and clear, that would be fantastic, and it'll uh, let me know that uh, I've got your full attention, um, or at least some of it. Terrific, they're all coming in and we've got people all over the, the state and a little bit more broadly as well. So thanks for your attendance. It appears that uh, I'm being heard loud and clear. We did have some issues in the last webinar, which I think may have been a function of uh, the number of people with technology in my house. So we've tried to uh, overcome that tonight. So hopefully we won't have a problem. If you do, if you can just indicate on that questions tab that you are having problems hearing and uh, it's likely that if you're having those same problems, uh, others may be too and I'll try and address it by repeating what I've done. We're pretty new to this webinar process but we've found it actually quite efficient and it appears through the feedback a lot of you are finding it reasonably efficient as well. So thanks for taking the time tonight. In terms of the funding for tonight's program, it's funded through the MLA More Beef from Pastures project. MLA have fully funded this and the aim of these webinars is to give you a taste of the type of information that's available through More Beef from Pastures. Much of this information is available in more detail in follow-up events where we aim to improve knowledge and skills and ultimately change practices for the better. So this is a feed in if you like to additional events. So that survey is important to us for you to give us feedback as to what you'd like more of over the next six to eight months of investment in that program because uh, there is funding there to assist you to get improve your skills and ultimately make practice change on farm. This slide shows a screenshot of the More Beef from Pastures manual online. So this, this picture just shows the range of modules within the online manual and there's about seven of them. And tonight what I'll be doing is talking to the setting directions module. This module is all about assessing the current position of your business, establishing business goals and understanding options for improvement. And that's really where labour efficiency sits within that, within that module. In terms of tonight's presentation, what I'll do is I'll talk a little about how to measure labour efficiency. Then I'll go in on to talk about what's achievable and then I'll talk a little about how to achieve it. It's relatively simple in beef enterprises relative to lamb or sheep or cropping enterprises and 
from our analysis, there are a few simple things that you can do that tend to make a big difference in terms of labour efficiency. So what is labour efficiency? Well, labour efficiency is a measure of the efficiency with which labour resources are being employed in your business. Labour resources in a beef business are basically referred to from this point on as labour units. In beef businesses, benchmarking measures the efficiency of labour as the number of dry sheep equivalents managed per labour unit. So that leads us into the question, what is a labour unit? A labour unit is any owner, operator or family member, contractor or employee working within the farm business. Now there's no distinction between those labour units employed within the business using that methodology. So a first year jackaroo is not necessarily distinct from an owner operator. And that suggests that skill and competency isn't necessarily a point of differentiation made in the labour efficiency benchmark. And this just means that as with many benchmarks, the output needs to be considered in context. So be careful when you're comparing labour efficiency that you, if you're comparing that benchmark that you scratch the surface because there could be a range of skills and competency based stuff that is driving the output. In terms of what a full-time labour unit is, a full-time labour unit in our language consists of 240 days per year. The 240 days has been calculated by deducting 114, uh, 104 rather weekend days and deducting four weeks or 20 days of holidays from 365. So on this slide in front of you, you've got the total days, 365 in the year, the weekend days and the weekday uh, holidays, which is 20, that gets down to 240 days per year. So the full-time equivalence is 240 working days per year. Uh, Rob Lee's just mentioned sick days. Look, uh, they're not in there, but um, the 240 really is consists of that, that makeup. There isn't an allocation for sick days um, in there, Rob, but uh, fit farmers never get sick. Okay. And I'm saying that tongue in cheek for those of you who don't understand my sense of humour. Um, so what if I work more than 240 days? What I'm doing here is really just going through a number of uh, frequently asked questions regarding labour efficiency because in, in an attempt to hopefully assist you in really understanding the nuts and bolts of labour efficiency. So. It's fine if you work more than 240 days. And in fact, most, uh, most businesses do. Someone else has uh, mentioned long service leave. Look, um, it's not part of the, our labour efficiency, um, efficiency calculations. Doesn't mean you're not entitled to it. It's just not part of our calculation. So in fact, I guess if, if we get down to the nuts and bolts of sick days, long service leave and things like working eight hour days, well, realistically, we're probably closer to um, 220 days of the year. And that will just mean that you guys um, actually have a far higher level of than a full time labour unit working within your business. But I'll get to that shortly. So if you work for more than 240 days, which I suspect most of you do because the nature of your business, uh, the total days in the year, I've just put an example up here. Um, the, the extent to which you or your employer or your contract is, is categorised as more than a full-time labour unit really depends on the extent to which additional days or hours are worked. So in this example, half of all weekends are worked and only 10 days of holidays are taken per year. That's 10 weekdays. So this adds 66 days to the working year, which is the equivalent of approximately 30% of a labour unit. Now that's calculated by dividing 66 days by the 240 days of a full-time labour unit. So that means in this case, 
the full-time labour unit equivalents for that particular business is 1.3. So they've worked 306 days, which is the equivalent to 1.3 labour unit equivalents. And I am going somewhere with this. Um, so calculating labour efficiency, it's just the number of dry sheep equivalents managed by the number of full-time labour units employed or engaged within the business. And I'll, I'll show you how to do that shortly. So why does it matter? Why does labour efficiency matter? Labour and labour-related expenses account for over 25% of the total cost structure in a beef business. So anything you can do to improve the efficiency and the effectiveness of labour is likely to influence profitability in a positive way. Now, it doesn't always occur like that, uh, and there's a range of reasons that it doesn't always occur like that. Because if you just focus on labour efficiency, then you leave some of the other really important things behind. Uh, that's no good. So as with a lot of other key benchmarks, you can't focus on solely one benchmark, but this one is one that will usually be uh, in some way linked to profitability. The linkage always isn't that tight. The slide, This slide shows the difference in labour efficiency between the most profitable nine producers over the last five years and the average of the home sacket benchmarking database. While there's not necessarily a really strong relationship between labour efficiency and labour cost, it can be a useful indicator. The, so in this case, the most profitable have a total cost of labour, inclusive of contractors, of $4.13 per DSE, compared with $6.07 for the average. So that accounts for over 40% of the $4.60 difference per DSE in overheads between that most profitable cohort and the average of all. And you can see the difference in labour efficiency is that the average of all achieving about 15,000 DSEs per labour unit, incidentally that is weighted by the inclusion of some of those most profitable people within that data set and the most profitable sitting over 18,000 uh, DSEs per labour unit. Incidentally, there's, there's very little difference in the supplementary feed bill between those two cohorts, even though the most profitable carried approximately 40% more DSEs. It's possible though that the way supplementary feed is, is fed accounts for some of the difference. So the reason I'm alluding to supplementary feed is that it can be a reasonable cost within a business. In this case, I think it's not a huge cost uh, within either of these cohorts. In autumn ca carving operations, it tends to be a reasonable cost within the business. So how is labour efficiency, or how is labour allocated to enterprises? So, what I'm doing here is just giving you an example for a business which is a mixed business, and in this case it's a mixed beef and cropping business, to demonstrate how labour efficiency is, how labour units are allocated within the business. So labour efficiency for individual businesses in multiple enterprise businesses is usually calculated by adding the number of days worked by all the labour in the enterprise during the year. So that includes owners, managers, employees and contractors. Now there is an additional component to labour and that's the administrative and overhead labour. And that's, that's basically allocated to the enterprise proportional to the income of that enterprise relative to the total income generated on farm. Now that doesn't mean it's the only way to, do, to allocate that overhead labour, it's the way we do it in our farm benchmarking service. There may be better ways of doing it, that's the way we do it. So the table in this slide applies to a beef business running about 14,000 DSEs as beef, uh, which is equivalent to about 530 breeders turning off feedlot entry weight steers. Farm scale in this case is about 1,200 hectares with an additional 400 hectares dedicated to crop. And the table shows that 
In this case, the owner manager uh, has allocated 300 days of his time, and that's allocated in our benchmarking by participants actually nominating the number of days that they work. And the remaining 66 days are worked by contractors and employees, including casual farm labourers and crop and livestock contractors. The next part of the process is to allocate the number of days to each of the enterprises within the farm. And that's what I've done here. That can be done either by allocating the absolute number or the percentage of, of labour unit days as being done in this case. So in this case, the labour is allocated to the beef enterprise, the, the crop enterprises and general. And when I'm talking about general, really what I'm talking about is administrative costs, pasture costs and uh, it could be that over, there are other overhead type costs that um, are applied to that ad administration and overhead uh, type. Maintenance of buildings would be an example of something that may be in that category as well. So the total amount of labour of each employee should add up to 100% in this case. Once that operational component, sorry, I'll just go back to that preceding slide. So the key, the key message coming out of this is that the beef enterprise, in terms of operational labour, has accumulated 170, roughly 170 operational days allocated to the beef enterprise. The crop enterprise has 110 labour days allocated by the percentage multiplied by that's the percentage of their time multiplied by the number of days to give those numbers down below. And the general 87 now has to be allocated between beef and crop. So hopefully everyone's still with me on this example. So in this case, I'm going to demonstrate how that general labour is now allocated between enterprises. And in this case, enterprise income from beef, even though it had a far greater area, it's roughly only producing 50% or 52% of total farm income, crop being far more, far more profitable in this case, or generating far more income in this case rather, generates 48% of gross farm income from only 400 hectares. So effectively that 87 days worth of general or overhead labour is then allocated according to the enterprise income as a percentage of total income. So 87 multiplied by 52% gives me 45 days and 87 multiplied by 48% gives me 42 days. So the total labour efficiency days there are 215 for beef and 155 for crop. So from this, what we can establish is what percentage of a full-time labour unit is allocated to each of those enterprises. And in this case, 215 divided by the 240 days of a full-time labour unit is 90% of a full-time labour unit. And if you look at the crop, 155 is 65%, 155 divided by 240 is 65% of a full-time labour unit. 14,000 DSEs are managed with that 90% of a full-time labour unit and that gives us labour efficiency of 15,623 DSEs per labour unit. In terms of the crop, the process is exactly the same. It's just hectares per labour unit rather than uh, DSEs per labour unit. So those labour units are a measure of efficiency. There's a question here. If we are manager, bookkeeper, etc., for labour efficiency days, should we allocate time spent in those areas as such rather than just under time spent as manager? Okay. Um, I think it's important to allocate those according to where you spend it is more important. So if, if for example, you don't have a bookkeeper but you do... 12 days of bookkeeping within your business, that is more important. Who does the work where is less important to us than 
ensuring the work is allocated to the right enterprise. So hopefully I've answered your question there, uh, Jason. But that is a very good question. And, and the reality is in most cases, you will be responsible for operational duties, you will be responsible for capital duties, and I'll talk about how those capital duties are, um, are treated as well. And um, you're responsible for bookkeeping and every other thing within the business. It's not that we need you necessarily to allocate, you know, the percentage of time that you've that you've spent um, in assisting uh, cows or that sort of thing, but it is important that um, just to get it down to an enterprise level. Once you're getting more detailed, it actually can be useful to then work out where your time's going, and that's sort of the next step, which I'm not really covering tonight. But that's a great question. The exception. Uh, sorry, there's another question. What about the days where you wear potentially all the different hats, and how do you recall this? In a, how do you record this in an efficient manner? Yeah, great question, Rory. Thanks for your question. Look, the best way I've found to do it is have about, uh, I guess, up to no more than ten uh, tasks or operations that you deal with and allocate the percentage of time at the end of each day. Do that for, for a percentage of the year and use that as your template. Now, I know that's not always going to work because you carve at a certain time and you do certain operations at a certain time, but it's a useful means of, it, but you generally know how many days you're doing those sorts of things, and then it's using that template for the other parts of your business. So that's the most efficient way and effective way. And it's interesting when you go down that path, Rory, that um, what you tend to find is about 30% of your time uh, is very difficult to account for when you do it retrospectively. So doing it at the time is useful. In other cases, what we've found is there's uh, a lot of inefficient time in, you know, I sure a bolt and I drove to town I bought the, bought the bolt, but I had to do about 13 other jobs and it took me half a day. And a lot of your time can be consumed by those sorts of things. And so measuring that is, is a useful process in my, in my opinion. Look, I'm just going to talk to some of the exceptions, which are labour for capital investments, such as fencing. Capital expendi expenditure is actually a cost that occurs below the profit line in, in our accounting system. And allocation of labour used in capital investment projects really shouldn't be allocated to the enterprise or to the overhead component. So we all allocate it as a below the profit line expense. And labour employed for engaged in activities or operations that aren't farm related. So in some large scale businesses, uh, there can be a reasonable amount of labour employed to keep up appearances and maintain a perceived high level of aesthetic appeal. I believe that's a discretionary cost and shouldn't be included in the measures of labour efficiency at the enterprise level. So it's fine to include it and understand that it's cost for that business, but I don't think it should be compared against a range of other businesses because it's not really the true cost of doing business uh, in that business. And really what we're looking for is labour efficiency related to the running of an enterprise. So what is the level of labour efficiency that's been achieved over the last little while. Well, this graph shows the rolling five-year average labour efficiency of the Home Sackett Farm Benchmarking Database. And I'm not suggesting that that may be typical of the broader uh, population, but it is usually a, a reasonable indicator given that um, the broader population, the data for the broader population tends not to be um, that great surrounding some of these key performance indicators. So in this graph, what we've got is labour efficiency increasing at a compounding rate of growth of about 2.8% um, per year over that data set. And this is this has basically resulted in a shift from 11,000 DSEs per labour unit to over 14,000 DSEs per, per labour unit uh, over that 12-year period. Now, one of the interesting features I think about this graph is that is the kick in labour efficiency from 2010 to 2014 
And I think part of the reason for the increase over that period is the increase in scale of a number of beef businesses over that same period. And most of those businesses have increased the number of DSEs under management without necessarily increasing labour at all. Or if they have increased labour, it's been in a reasonably minor way. And so what that's done is increased uh, labour efficiency for those businesses, which has skewed the data set. And I think it's a great message as to what can be achieved. A lot of those businesses considered that they could do more with their existing resources and they have proven that they, they have achieved that. I just went on further to analyse the data in two cohorts, I guess, to look at how has the level of labour efficiency changed over time. And I, there's two periods here. There's 2005 to 2009, uh, which are the blue bars. And on the left-hand axis is the percentage of benchmarking participants as a contribution of all, benchmark, all beef benchmarking businesses. So the orange bars uh, represent the 2010 to 2014 period and the blue is 2005 to 2009. Now what I've done is just divided things into different uh, cohorts here. There's less than 5,000 DSEs per labour unit, 5 to 10, 10 to 15, 15 to 20 and greater than 20. And there was a period where you wouldn't even consider greater than 20 on a graph like this and now you can see that um, it's a reasonable proportion of the total that are actually in sit with labour efficiency above 20,000 DSEs per labour unit. So I guess the message I take from this graph is that over 50% of benchmarking participants had labour efficiency levels less than 10,000 DSEs per labour unit in 2005 to 2009. That same cohort or the number of percentage of benchmarking participants in that group is now less than 30% over the last five years. At the other end of the scale, the percentage of benchmarking participants with labour efficiency exceeding 15,000 DSEs per labour unit moved from less than 20% from 2005 to 2009 to 35% from 2010 to 2014 and there's more with greater than 20,000 DSEs per labour unit. So I think this graph's a great one for setting the benchmarks and showing what levels of labour efficiency can be achieved. Now there's a few underlying factors about how they achieved it. One is, yes, they did get bigger, but I think there's also the contribution of the investment in infrastructure that has been made that is contributing uh, to those sorts of levels of labour efficiency and I'll talk to that shortly. So some people look at this graph and say, well, I'm sitting at, you know, I'm sitting in average, I'm sitting at around 10 to 15,000 DSEs per labour unit, I'm doing okay. I tend to look at that graph and look out to the right-hand side of it and say, look, there's more people achieving greater than 20,000 DSEs per labour unit. How do I get there? How are they doing it? What are the things I need to do to be one of those because that will improve my level of profitability. And incidentally, it's not always getting bigger that gets you there. In many cases, it may be actually uh, working off farm and just appreciating that you're not a full-time labour unit. You, never, you may never get to that scale, in which case appreciate that you're not. Do you work elsewhere or a fair proportion of it elsewhere? and work for the proportion of time that uh, the scale of your business does allow, that still allows for high levels of labour efficiency. So hitting the targets. Look, I'll just talk to these pictures first before I get into the detail. I just thought it was useful to put these up to jag our memory about what other industries do to achieve high levels of labour efficiency. And these are just a couple that came to mind uh, to me quite quickly and the first is you know when you go into Qantas now on a, on a plane um, you don't you're not greeted by a person you're greeted by a machine and pretty well now there's a lot more machines than there are people in terms of checking your baggage uh, the bank job you know they'll tell you they're all about servicing us but uh, realistically 
these little machines have replaced a whole lot of labour within those businesses. And the final one is the Woolworths um, example. In that case, and, and Coles is no different, of course, but or any of them, but uh, they've all gone down the, the way of machines replacing humans. Now, I think there's some real messages there for agriculture, and that is if you can find ways of implementing infrastructure and machines replacing labour, then it's going to result in bottom line improvements in many cases. But understand how to analyse it. I'm over time and I don't like being over time, so I'll quickly run through this slide. Look, there's three uh, keys to maintaining high levels of, of labour efficiency in my view. And the first is systems that match feed supply to feed demand. I've gone on about this in the other webinars and I continue to do it because it's really responsible for a fair bit of labour efficiency too and I'll talk to that shortly. Infrastructure that allows for efficient move, movement and handling of livestock. Uh, the next one is uh, planning to ensure that the pressure on water and fencing infrastructure doesn't result in recurring repairs and maintenance. So I'm going to talk to those in a little more detail now. The first one is systems. One of the key features that differentiates the most profitable from the remainder is systems that match feed supply with feed demand. So, so um, it's even though that that cohort runs more DSEs, they don't necessarily have a supplementary feed bill that differs uh, from the average. So it's not unexpected to have large energy deficits in autumn calving herds, for example, because peak energy demands coincide with periods when, when pastures are least likely to have adequate feed quality. So those, those herds generally have a large supplementary feeding component to the business. Uh, the greater the supplementary feeding component, the greater the propensity for labour to be consumed by that. But that's not the only thing. As carving moves later, the, the requirement to supply energy or quantity deficit declines and the supplementary feeding requirements usually decline, with the exception being the spring drought, I guess. Um, and, and a recent study that we uh, looked at in operational labour at autumn calving herds found 12% of the total operational labour was spent on feeding alone. Now it's nowhere near that in um, other herds and that is one reason to move to um, uh, uh, alternative calving dates. Now spring calving herds aren't immune from feeding but given the nutritional demands of cows are, are at their lowest in autumn, then they tend not to have the same annual supplementary feeding requirements. So that matching feed supply with feed demand or setting up a sensible system still provides a competitive advantage when it comes to labour. When you get to infrastructure, one of the key points of difference between those with very high levels of labour efficiency, which aren't necessarily the most profitable, um, and the remainder is that they tend to have invested in infrastructure that's led to improvements in labour efficiency. So the aim is really to get operational tasks to the point where they can be completed by a single labour unit rather than multiple labour units. So the key components that assist in achieving that are usually laneways and adequate working cattle handling facilities, if you like. So laneways are a high priority because they can turn, you know, a couple of man job into a single man job, but it doesn't mean that they always generate a high return on investment. Each case is going to be different and it's going to depend on the number of time livestock are handled through that system, the cost of the fencing and the cost of labour. So they're three critical components and if you don't understand how to do an investment analysis, now's the time to learn or before you do conduct the infrastructure change is the time to learn. You'll notice I said adequate working cattle handling facilities. I didn't say the latest and greatest cattle handling facility. Um, and the key difference in those is that one may generate a reasonable return on investment while the other tends not to. And what I mean by that is the marginal benefit in labour efficiency afforded by the latest and greatest technology is usually far exceeded by the marginal cost and that means the return on investment from those type of yards is usually low when compared to more basic facilities. 
That is, they make you feel marginally more comfortable or a lot more comfortable when you're working with cattle, but they won't make you more profitable. Now, I understand there's OH&S requirements. This is assuming that your OH&S requirements can be met by both sets of infrastructure. So the real message there for that infrastructure is if you don't know how to conduct investment analysis now or before you start those projects is the time because there could be far better places to invest on farm. Um, the next one I'm going to go on to, and I know I'm over time, I'll be one more minute. Think about the long-term nature of investments in water and fencing infrastructure and plan locations of gateways and water infrastructure carefully. There's a lot of time, I know I'm telling you what you already know, but our experience when we analyse this is that a lot of time in beef businesses is consumed by repairs and maintenance. So getting it right in the first place can save a lot of time later on. And it's amazing how just a leaky trough continuing to leak can actually be, you can generate far better returns on investment by taking it out and putting in a whole new one. Now there's some caveats around that of course. Look, I'm just going to talk quickly to the point of effectiveness, um, which is really don't do the things that don't add value. There's plenty of people out there mollycoddling cows. If you don't need to mollycoddle cows, don't handle them. There's plenty of times people are bringing them into yards and handling them and being around them when they should just be left alone. That's keeping you busy. It's not actually generating you revenue. And if you've got what I call workshop time, which is busy time, that doesn't generate your revenue, consider that you or your staff should probably be working off farm for a proportion of your time. Now, um, that might mean you've got to sack someone or you may have to sack yourself. Okay, so look, the key messages really uh, for me, uh, labour efficiency is, is important um, because labour is the major cost in the business. It's no different to any other business. Um, learn how to measure it. I've given you a brief template. If you want more detail, please give us feedback in those feedback surveys because it will be useful for us. Look for low cost ways of replacing labour with infrastructure, but know how to analyse it because not all infrastructure leads to good returns on investment. And finally, consider the impact of your systems on labour efficiency. So, Look, I appreciate your time. I'm going to open it up for questions now and I apologise for going over time. Uh, there is a survey that will open at the end of this. I really appreciate it if you can just fill it in. It won't take any more than two minutes of your time. So uh, there's a few questions here. What about days where you uh, record this? Uh, okay, I think I've already answered all those. Are there... Any other questions, I'll open it up now or points that you'd like to clarify or make that uh, where your experience is different to what I've presented. I'm not being flooded with uh, questions at the moment. That could just be, here we go. Will genetics assist? Uh, Will genetics assist? Look, I'm struggling to think how genetic, genetics can actually, well, depending on, I'm not sure where your question's coming from. Uh, oh, easy handling cattle, okay. Um, look, there's, there's some ways in which genetics um, can assist and there's some ways where it may actually make things more complex. So, for example, um, some people argue that they don't want the complexity of a crossbreeding system because they like the simplicity of a, um, a single breed system. I appreciate that and it is likely that, um, that crossbreeding will lead to a greater amount of handling or separation of livestock and so on. Um, and so that is one way where genetics or the management of genetics may actually in, uh, decrease your labour efficiency. Um, look, there could be things like uh, uh, um, birth weights and those sorts of things that actually improve labour efficiency. Uh, the question, so hopefully I've answered that. Genetics may go either way, 
um, in terms of labour efficiency. But look, either way, I don't think it's a big contributor to improvements or otherwise. I think it's uh, uh, one at the margins. Uh, what DSE rating are you giving a breeding cow? Thanks for the question, Nigel. Look, she's nine DSEs while she's dry or pre-lactation. She's 15 in early lactation, the first three to four months, and she's 17 DSEs uh, per head as a late lactation for the last uh, four or, or five to six to eight, depending on when you wean. The questions come in from your data set, what is normally the most profitable reduction in labour or increase in, in, in intensity or scale? From your data set, what is normally most profitable? Oh, okay, it's a question or, or reduction in labour or increase in intensity or scale. Uh, okay, um, I would call them the same thing actually. Uh, so a reduction in labour, assuming the um, assuming that reduction in labour is for an, a predetermined level of DSEs, is actually an intensity in my view. Um, so so my view is that you are intensifying or or improving scale by reducing your labour. So it's not much different whether you, whether you work off farm. I'll, I'll give you an example. I'm going to go to another presentation to show you what I mean by that. Um, I'll go to, I think it's in this one. Okay. No, it's not in that one. Uh, I'll just quickly get up to, try and get to the point where um, I find this presentation which might assist me in answering that question to you. Uh, escape. Now, here we go. Right up. So it, I guess the context of this, Rory, is that, um, is that uh, there's a number of ways that you can improve labour efficiency. And, and in this case, what I assumed on the left-hand axis, we've got labour efficiency. Um, and the top line is assume you've got an existing business that is at 66% labour efficiency. So if you think about it, let's call uh, optimum labour efficiency in a beef herd 20,000 DSE, DSEs. Uh, this was sitting at 66% uh, of that. There's, an, there's a number of other options. The first is you could actually expand your land area to achieve 100% labour efficiency or you could work off farm for a proportion of your time to achieve 100% labour efficiency. Now what I've got along the bottom axis is profit and what they show is just the differences in profit from each option and the differences uh, from expanding it. There's a whole lot of under, underlying assumptions about this slide, but, the, but in this case, expanding your land area does provide you with more profit um, than working off farm, but it also requires a lot more capital and so on. So I guess my key point that I want to make is um, you can achieve improvements in labour efficiency by getting bigger, but it's not always the right thing to do. And you have to be conscious that in many cases, um, you may not have the, uh, the capital to do that or you may not have the financing ability, in which case working off farm may be a better option. I hope that answers your question. Uh, and I'll get back to my preceding presentation. Okay, uh, what about increases in carrying capacity? Yes. Um, that's a good point. So the question is, can I achieve an improvement in labour efficiency by increasing my carrying capacity? Yes, you certainly can. Assuming you've got the uh, resources to improve carrying capacity or stocking rate, then that is a brilliant way of improving labour efficiency. And in fact, you know, nine times out of 10, you don't need any more labour to manage the additional stocking rate that's achieved from those productivity changes. 
Uh, pasture improvement, improving obviously increases the number of DSE carried. It also adds value to the farm. How is this added value accounted for? Okay. Um, thanks for the question, Hugh. Pasture improving obviously increases DSEs carried. Um, that is true, and that can lead to labour efficiency, assuming you don't need any more labour for the same number of DSEs that you increase your stocking rate by. It also adds value to the farm. How is this ad added value accounted for? Um, look, sometimes it doesn't add I don't know, Hugh, whether you were in our pasture um, uh, pasture webinar from the other night, but uh, the, one of the points I made at that pasture webinar was it doesn't always add value or it may add value in a very minor way. Um, and how is that added, added value accounted for? Look, it's usually accounted for in the additional productivity and the costs are usually accounted for in the um, additional costs accrued. Uh, as pasture improvement expenses. But the key point I want to make is pasture improvement can increase DSE carried, but my view is it's usually the last in a line of things that you would do from return on investment. And the first is um, increase the number of livestock and improve pasture utilisation from the existing resource base. The next is up your fertility and increase your, the amount of feed and increase the number of livestock that way. And finally, once you've achieved those gains, then go down the path of pasture improvement. But that, that's a good point um, that Hugh has made. So thanks for your contribution. Are there any other questions or points? I just want to push the uh, survey again. Please fill it out for us. It's really important. Even if you haven't got value, that's important for us to hear. Uh, that you haven't got value out of it. That's as important for us because we're reporting back to MLA and they want to know that they've generated a return on their investment. So I'm not getting any more questions. So I'll assume that uh, I've adequately covered what I said we would. If you want more on this topic, more than happy to do it um, and more than happy to contribute. Um, please give us that feedback. And you can obviously dig into a lot more detail in, um, in other forums or in workshops and those types of things. So uh, there's a question here, is there a risk of targeting labour efficiency at the expense of production? Now, that's a very good question, actually. Thanks for the question, Joe. Um, yes, labour efficiency shouldn't be targeted at any cost. You have to ensure that because small changes in production or reductions in production will result in um, you know neg a negation if you like or will negate any of the benefits of the improvement in labor efficiency so I guess the key point is understand um, that you can't just work off farm during a period where it's particularly important in terms of productivity but there could be all sorts of measures that you apply that actually don't come at the expense of production. So, for example, I guess one is, um, you know, acting proactively in terms of your animal health program, which is really important at optimum stocking rates in any case. So I think you've made a really good point, Joe. I appreciate it because, um, yes, there is a point at which uh, you don't want to target labour efficiency because it's coming at the cost of, um, of production losses. So it has to be done in a very sensible way. Thanks for your point. Uh, there's still people online and unless there's any questions, I might wrap it up there. But look, thank you very much for your time tonight. Hopefully I've generated some value for you and understanding of labour efficiency. Uh, I look forward to seeing you. We've got more webinars next week uh, and there are a range of production related webinars uh, with uh, a few vets and others in the animal health uh, game. And we are also, we'll also circulate some emails regarding how to log on to the preceding webinars if you'd like to, um, if you'd like to brief up again. So thanks for your contribution. Really appreciate it and we'll see you in the next webinar. Bye now.